Welcome to another episode of the Circle of Debate podcast. I am your host, Chris Kennedy, and this is my first episode featuring a musician that's going to be providing a top five, Mr. Jared Smith of the band Heliocentric. I say band. You are the band, my friend. You are the one-man powerhouse. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lonely solo act, man. We out here. I'm out here. Is it solo because of literally where you're at? I don't know too much about where you are in North Carolina or not finding friends. Not friends, but like-minded musicians. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're not Boo, no, Rad- no. You're not Boo Radley or anything, are you? <laughs> <laughs> so, honestly, it's a, it's a funny thing where, like, the way that it happened was I bought my first guitar when I was 19 and uh, started immediately, like, recording demos. And my thought was, yeah, you know, I'll churn out some riffs, get some, like, song ideas, and eventually, you know, I'll find some other bandmates and they'll join up with me and we'll start a band but what ended up happening was like i kept writing these riffs and then it's like oh i'm writing these riffs but oh if i tweak this and this and do a little eq and compression oh now it sounds like you know a little bit better and you know a few years later it's like shoot i've accidentally accumulated all of this gear i've accidentally (laughs) you know written a handful of songs it's like shoot i guess i i guess i can just do this on my own and heliocentric was born i get that for sure because i'm at a place right now where there's a bunch of music i'm trying to write because i'm still trying to find my my new voice i guess you would say in this particular project but i want to write as much as i can on my own and then shop that to potential members when it comes um with the uh, open-ended result of their input being accepted if it was input that i wanted um yeah is it just a matter of like is it is it um not pride hubris like i want to be the guy who did that or is it not finding other people or is it why do i even need to i mean at at this point it's kind of a combination of like hubris and and yeah it just i it doesn't it doesn't seem needed at the moment so i mean the only reason why i would bring other people on would be to tour um and that sounds amazing uh, I know a guy you know, that's a, I'm about 3000 miles away, but you know, I volunteer as tribute. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're hired. I'm into um, it, man. I'll learn everything in uh, about four days. <laughs> I gotta get, honestly, I gotta get an eight. I gotta get an eight string, but that's, that's, I got a seven string. So I'm already, I'm already used to wide frets and stuff. So cool. Dude, given, given how much you shred, my stuff is probably, it's like too easy for you. You're, I, be there's no such stage. thing. I'm not that guy <laughs> to me. Um, I've passed this competitive playing level where I know I can't compete with people that are half my age. Um, I'll look at, obviously I use Tim Henson from, um, Polyphia as a great example of a kid, half my age, 10 mm. times as good. And if you get discouraged by players like that, you're just going to quit. So what yeah. I've done is I've tricked my insecurities as a guitar player, as the, the um the sake of the song which is how it should be is i don't care how shreddy you are it's is the song relatable or good uh i make this terrible comparison to ingve and nirvana that nirvana sold more records with one song than ingve's entire career Hmm. and that's not to judge the quality of the players it's just one of them might be more relatable to a listener one of them might be more relatable to other shredders it really mm-hmm. depends on where you want to go with your style. And with your style, with the entire album, I think it tells a story. Um, yeah. Maybe other people, maybe shredders aren't going to be like, oh, he's not the shreddiest. There's a great solo in one of your, I think it's in Never Again. You might have a solo in there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. awesome. Which I was like, oh, awesome. Not, not that I needed to be impressed. I don't need to be impressed with playing. I need to relate to a story. The playing is fantastic. But I don't care if you have a 2,000 note solo. If the song yeah. doesn't make any sense or if that solo just comes out of nowhere for the sake of it coming out of nowhere. Um, so I appreciate the compliment. It was a roundabout way of me <laughs> explaining how humble I am. <laughs> but I would never look at something as being too easy for me to play unless it wasn't interesting. Um, sure. So, yeah, that's basically where I'm at with my life. I've accepted some things, but I'm always trying to get better. Um, mm-hmm. But never discouraged. Uh, I do have to fight through. Should I just quit? You know, like, Mm. me and Periphery are, like, the same age, and they've been around for 20 years. I'm like, I can't even find band members. I'm in in the hub for band members in Hollywood. So, um, but you, again, getting it all done by yourself. Um, Ishmael's the newest release, 
but not your first release. You do have two prior that I have up here. Uh, yeah. Or at least one. Perpetual Felicity is your full other release. It only came out two years ago. And then you've mm-hmm. released some singles that made their way onto Ishmael since then, which were Whispers, Never Again, and Antithesis. Um, yeah. And I did have an EP before Perpetual Felicity called Contra Mundum. That was a little five-song demo reel thing. And, and, but all of those songs were unique. They weren't uh, re-featured on Perpetual Felicity. Gotcha. Which were the songs that, um, the singles for Antithesis, Never Again, and Whispers, those were intended to be on Ishmael when you release yeah. them? Okay. Mm-hmm. So they weren't like, oh, I've got some songs that came out. Let me throw them on the record. Nah. No, because they're, I mean, they're carbon copies of the ones that are on the record. So, like, um, yeah, that was all super intentional as far as, like, uh, doing a proper release. Um, doing singles before the actual release is a great way to boost your metrics and a great way to, like, garner fan interaction before, you know, the big bombshell. Right. Um, I mean, that's currently like what uh, Gojira is doing. They released um, Born for One Thing and Amazonia and one other song. Um, and the and, and know, the plugin, the Neural DSP shout out, the Neural. Yeah. The, that plugin came out of essentially nowhere because I know Neural likes to do like a coming soon, but that soon mm-hmm. is like next Tuesday. And everyone's yeah. like, oh, who's it going to be? Is it going to be this, that, or the other? Um, and I'm in the Neural DSP group on Facebook, and a lot of people, I think, didn't think it was going to be Gojira. I think they were all surprised and like, holy, holy shit. I'm buying that immediately. Yeah. Um, but that was with the release. So it's like virtual marketing is like you said, where the bombshells can land for sure. And it worked with you because I'm a fan. I can't specify exactly where that happened. If it was sponsored content on Instagram, I know it was definitely Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I just, when I see something, I, I listen to it because Instagram is a, there are a lot of reasons people don't like it and I like it for the curated content that I have get thrown my way, which is in the music world. And you were right up my alley. Um, so (laughs) it works, man. If you guys are afraid to spend an extra 10 to 20 bucks on a track to put on Instagram, you are missing out. I promise it pays off. Um, yeah. So I know that you've done another podcast addressing this. I don't know if this question has been asked about Ishmael. The world may already know that it was a passion project. That was a college your finals exam it was like your senior project Mm -hmm. yeah um the previous releases obviously were not were those like your freshman and junior projects no so ishmael was the only one that was actually related to like my formal studies um well so (laughs) it was the only one that i got graded on uh it's the only one that i turned into a professor so um yeah my my first two projects my first two albums the contramundum ep and perpetual felicity um yeah like i bought my first guitar at 19 like i said and immediately how, how can i ask how, how old are you how, i'm 26 so still a young pup the thing um, that i said about tim henson being half my age and twice as good you've done all of this in seven years <laughs> Can you sit down and, I mean, humbly say wow to yourself at all and be like, just, you have to hold your baby in your hands and be like, I made this and it took me seven years to go from not knowing what a guitar was to putting out a slightly complicated metal record featuring so many different genres. Like, that's insane. I'm 10 years older than you and I've been playing since I was 13. So to, wow. to, to see that is um, not discouraging at all impressive in a in a way i would say proud as far as other musicians go so that's pretty amazing um thank you man to to be there in six six years man that's all like um but you were saying about ishmael the the, leading up to that as your senior project and the the previous release is not being school centric yeah yeah huh centric school centric i know i i said that in the instagram i'm like i'm, I'm trying to make a music centric <laughs> podcast pun in, pun kind of intended it just is a word i've used and it, it's it, it fits it fits for sure hey man it checks out <laughs> uh, but yeah so with um perpetual felicity like that album was like four years in the making um and it took so long in part because I was learning how to play guitar in that timeline. Like, you know, some of the riffs um, I wrote like a year or two after picking up a guitar for the first time. Um, 
like the, there's one song on there called Phrygia and it's super simplistic. I mean like laughably simplistic now looking, listening back on it. Um, but it still has a warm fuzzy in my heart because it's like, yeah, I was, I was 20 when I wrote that riff and I was 24 when the, the album came out. Um, it's a cool feeling. Uh, but yeah, so, so Ishmael was different because Ishmael was literally the album that I handed to my professors in order to get my degree. It was like, okay, this is, you know, th this is your major. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, it's stupid to say, but I'm kind of the first person in history that I know of to have, uh, who, who studied theological heavy metal music in college. Um, oh, wow. and that's, it's got a cool ring to it, you know? Like, yeah. And that's what the, is that the, the, is the major in that specifically, or is it in like music or theory or business or theology? Yeah. So all of the above, um, I went to a tiny little college called Wheaton college up near Chicago, um, graduated this past May. And, uh, so Wheaton has the, one of the best interdisciplinary studies, uh, programs in the nation. And at a lot of colleges, when you study interdisciplinary studies, what that means is, you know, you don't really know what you want to study. You're indecisive. And so you just get a smattering of everything. Okay. You, know, you study a little bit of this, I, a little bit of that. I've heard of a Wheaton version is, of that, yeah. Yeah. Wheaton is very different where it's much more structured and has a, a very articulate direction. Um, the way Wheaton does it is you study one topic from three different academic disciplines. So I studied violence among the three Abrahamic faiths. So Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, and kind of the theological um, disagreements that they have with each other. And I studied that from the perspective of theology, ancient languages, and digital audio engineering. So my senior project was, you know, this album. That's literally what I turned into my professors, as well as a 93-page research paper um, explaining all of the lyrics, talking about some of the theories um, in the album, the theological implications of it, the sociological implications of some of these crazy ideas that I'm tossing around. Um, and yeah, it was... It was a good time. That, no regrets. That is insane. Um, was any of the material for Ishmael existing prior to when you had the idea to do this as your senior project? And you were like, oh, I have this great idea. Or was it like, I need an idea. I'll do a metal record. And then it was all from scratch. Yes. So basically what, <laughs> what happened was um, I, I, I went to Wheaton because I wanted to be an ancient languages scholar. In my mind, I was like, dude, I want to be one of these old geezers who's able to, like, you know... Uh, like Sanskrit? <laughs> yeah, you know, all of that. Like, So my professor, um, one of my academic advisors, named Doug Penny, amazing guy, he knows how to traverse 15 different languages. It may even be more than that, but it's at least 15 that he's able to pick up a Greek text and then compare it to the Latin translation and see the disparities between the Greek and the Latin and, oh, here's the uh, Aramaic text. I mean, just absolute brainiac. And I was like, I want to do that. That sounds cool. That's like Indiana Jones of languages. That was the name I was looking for. Yes. He's oh, like wait, I, didn't, I didn't even know Jones you were... kind of professor. That's crazy. So, I mean, I, I wanted to do that. Um, I got two years into it and realized I didn't have the brain power for it. Um, so really miserable, really hating everything and like wanting to pivot, but it's like, shoot, I've, I've already dug myself into this major. I need another option. And then the possibility and the idea of interdisciplinary studies came in and it's like, shoot, well, I could just repurpose all of those credits and all of that study that I have done, um, into something that I could actually be proud of moving forward. Uh, and the idea of like doing a metal album about Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, and some of the hostilities that exist among them, that felt very true to like what I was passionate about was and am. Um, and yeah, it just felt like a, a natural outgrowth of, of what I was doing at the time. So, I mean, all of the album was written between 
yeah, I started writing it the the summer before my senior year. As soon as I got accepted into the program, I hit the ground running, started writing, and here we are now. This is a question I've had. You hand it into your professor. He hopefully listens to it. Mm-hmm. And is he near you when this happens? Does he take it home? What is his, is he like, is he a traditional old guy professor or is it one of those cool hip guys who's like, bro, metal, or he's like, well, the kids love it, but it's not really my thing, but, but you get an A anyways. So what makes it like even more scandalous, (laughs) it's a Christian, it's a Christian college. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, keep in mind, like, you know, nothing like this had, had been done at the school before, um, I mean, he he's overview or overseen some like weird projects before, but this one was, you know, making everyone's heads turn. Um, but I mean, he was he was amazing and he was super supportive and he was like, dude, I don't get it, but I. And that was a big part of my research paper was like, how do I explain what I'm doing in this and justify it to an academic audience? Right? How do I like convince people who think that metal is noise? How do I say no, 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 no? I'm expressing valid academic ideas here. I've got you know a hundred plus citations, you know, however many footnotes, and I'm I'm putting forth like ideas that deserve to be taken seriously. And this weird, crazy, stupid genre that we call metal, it feels like the most true sound of me wrestling with these academic questions. Um, and he loved it. I, I mean, to this day, like my, um, the, hang on, I, I've got the, <laughs> I've got the thing. Ugh. So this was the oh, wow. 93 page research paper that I handed into him um, with all the, where, where's those illustrations? Uh, there's a Meshuga picture in here somewhere. There which which is the Hebrew word for like Armageddon essentially, right? Like it's like a big mess. Is that am I wrong? I, I'm pretty sure Meshuga just means crazy. That's okay. That's what I meant to say. Like big mess. I thought it meant big mess. Like oh, it's a Meshuga. Oh, like okay. yeah, okay. I could see that. Um, but yeah. So I mean, there's a a copy of this that he still pretty proudly keeps on his desk and shows to prospective students and says like, hey, you could you could do a project like this. And to me, that's encouraging as like somebody who, you know, admires academia. It's like, yeah, I I don't think that a kid should go through college. And then the only thing he or she has to show for it is some 20 page paper that nobody is ever going to give a damn about. That feels wrong. It's like, you're going to spend four years on an education, make something that people will care about. And that's, that's what this is, is like, in, in doing my preparation for the album, um, I went and studied abroad uh, to the Middle East my junior year. And it's like, dude, I had conversations with people there. One in particular that stands out is uh, I sat down um, in a group um, with my classmates and giving a lecture, it was two speakers. One was a Palestinian man who had his daughter mowed down by an Israeli soldier. I mean, just totally by mistake. And sitting next to him was an Israeli man whose daughter had been blown up by a Palestinian suicide bomber. And they were sitting next to each other, holding hands, and they had become friends, and they had overcome their differences. That story deserves to be heard. It deserves to be told. It, it's such a, a an absolute, and excuse my French, an absolute mindfuck that I'll be damned if that story only sits in dust in some you know stupid paper that you turned into a professor. He read over for five minutes and forgot it ever happened. That's a travesty to me. And these stories, I, I care too much about them to not put them to music and not share them with people because it's something that deserves deserves to be heard absolutely um and you know like if if there's any um shortcomings in my album it's that i'm not i'm still not good enough of a musician to 
be able to properly encapsulate the kind of emotion that these stories warrant. Expect in something that is so clearly a tragedy and doing what you can as passionately as you are to uphold that respect. Because you, you, you're, there's no way that it could ever, I mean, compare or ever be worth, obviously, the loss. It would be insane to think that, feel, be- feel better about your tragedy because I wrote you a song. But oh, you, no. you, I, yeah. and I, know that, I know that you're not trying to do that or say that, but you can put as much heart and soul into something to pay your respects to someone as much as somebody would in, a, uh, in the eulogy or any other kind of, you know, a homage to a tragedy such as that. And to yeah. find a home for it, especially in metal where lyrically, I think content like that, even religious, religious subtext, I think has the best home. Uh, I don't listen to um, a lot of non-rock genres, specifically country, hip-hop, and rap are the ones that are outside of... And then international music, obviously, that's cultural. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the the confusion and the anger that I, I, and the angst that I think can be associated, obviously, with tragedy, but obviously with religion, sits mm-hmm. so well within the paradigm of rock and roll and metal because... Yeah. It can be your album itself can be loud and aggressive. Uh, it can be chaotic at times, but you do have interludes. You do have you do sing. You don't just do the t- 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 stereotypical what people think metal sounds like with the screaming. But you do have there. I guess the metal kids will call it the cleans. I call it singing because there's a difference. Um, <laughs> but that world is just so poetic and 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 can paint. I think the best portrait for those ideas and. Um, yeah to try to do that yourself is it, it's a huge uh, weight that you, that, like you said, you were like, I want to do the best to tell this story that deserves, deserves to be told, but heavy is to head the words, the crown, you know, metaphorically and maybe literally to do that is um, a lot of confidence that I think may have landed on the target as far as the efficiency of what you did and the storytelling that you portray. Cause Ishmael, in my opinion, it's a it's a concept record based on I don't want to find the wrong word the, the, theology, not necessarily mm-hmm. concepts, but the word theology itself are theories that people can find faith or believe in, or, and if they don't find those things, they can find something uplifting that they can associate with. Um, mm-hmm. And I relate to metal music for that reason because there's so many great ideas that are just aggressive enough to just fit right in there with the drums and the metal guitars and the, yeah. the loudness and then the quietness. So um, that's a, a brave attempt that you made that I, th- I I think was successful. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Um, now to pivot out of that, we are here. For, well, actually, I have I had, no, I, had, I had one more question. <laughs> lyrically, uh, lyrically, the source for the material were, was it three separate religious texts? And then you, I don't know if you combined scriptures from each one into one song or stuck to one uh, belief per song, or if you actually pulled verses and then routed them to fit lyrically, or if if none of that happened, what was that process? Yeah, so, I mean, in in doing research for all of this, there became certain issues that like became highlighted in my mind as really poignant um or or like really fascinating questions um so i mean there's you know one the the song whispers is all about the uh hearing the voice of god and so um judaism islam and christianity talk about that concept in kind of different verbiage um and it's fascinating and so you know what i would do is like okay here's my subject matter you know here's my thesis statement um what what relevant texts are there the in the quran that talk about this what relevant texts are there in the new testament that talk about this in the old testament um but then not just limiting my scope of like lyrical sources um to just the religious texts themselves but also like you know, um, there was a quote by, oh gosh, 
the uh, Infinite Jest. Who's the guy who wrote that? That's gonna bug me. I know. Um, I, I know. I've heard it through a, a comedian named Duncan Trussell, who's a big um, into philosophies. I don't know his name though, but I know that he's mentioned yeah. that book before. Um, I think we have Google. <laughs> we have Google. Gosh, what is that? Gosh, I forgot about that. Name? Would it be okay. David Foster Wallace? David Foster Wallace. I know that name. So I just a quote from. Oh my God! Are you serious? Okay, check this out. Sorry to butt in, but real quick. No, okay, so no. as I brought in, as I brought up just now, uh, a comedian, Duncan Trussell. Uh, I listen to a lot of stand-up comedian podcasts. I was just mm-hmm. doing some research on Bill Burr. Bill Burr studied under David Foster Wallace. This was already my most searched recent tab. If you look in my Wikipedia history, he was literally the last thing I googled. What? Yeah, and oh, dude. because Bill Burr was talking about, oh, he went to uh, uh, Chicago, right? He's from Chicago or something. Or, mm-hmm. and that I was like, right. yeah, and I was looking up like Bill Burr's like educational history, and it said he stuttered under David Foster Wallace. I'm like, oh, I wonder if he's done anything I did. I'm like, oh, they used one of his uh, literary pieces for they um, repurposed it for like Family Guy or something, um, or oh. some other some other thing. Uh, I had it right here, but they've uh, rewritten his stuff. Like, oh man, I just, literally just had it. adaptations. Uh, he did a movie with John Krasinski. Uh, do, 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 do Parks and Rec. There was an e- Patridge, an episode of Parks and Rec, repeatedly references Infinite Jest. There it is. And I love Parks and That's Rec, which so is so funny. Yeah, that th- we did not have. This wasn't pre-written. We didn't script this. <laughs> I had this literally yesterday. I'm like, I know that name, and I it was already purple. I'm like, why do I know that name? I'm like, oh, Bill Burr studied under him. So that's, that's small world. Wild. Yeah. Gosh, dude, that's that's <laughs> nutty. Um But yeah, so I mean like David Foster Wallace has a, a quote that makes a appearance in the song Whispers. Um there there's some like various uh because I mean, uh, that's the, the the thing about like interdisciplinarity is you you're studying one thing from a host of different disciplines. So like, what is um what does psychology say about hearing the voice of God? You know, because there's certainly overlap with auditory hallucinations and schizophrenia. So like, diving into a little bit of that research, um, you know, w- w- what kind of like cultural values um were the underpinning of hearing the voice of god how common was it what kinds of um modern equivalents are there what kind of weird modern phenomena are there now of people hearing the voice of god yeah like, there's um, all these kinds of questions without going um, too deep down the religious theo rabbit hole which you are vastly going to be far more educated on the theories, like you said, the psychology, what's the difference between the homeless guy talking to God and then the woman in the church talking to God? Not, yeah. you know, I, I'm not smart enough to have an opinion on that, but I know that there are also a lot of connections between psychedelics also and then mm-hmm. biblical text. Uh, the burning bush, they found out was an acacia tree that if it was on fire and you were standing next to it, it was emitting DMT, which a lot of people have related to religious experiences. So that is an entire wormhole literally of connecting the dots on you've read many sounds like different theologies texts um and then having to connect the dots or at least relate the dots like you were saying between what people want to hear what people do hear and why do they hear them yeah yeah no 100 percent. and then that made its way somehow into not just never again, but whispers, I think it was the track that we we're talking about specifically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, all of those kinds of research made their way into, um, the track whispers specifically, um, stuff about regarding the Israeli Palestinian conflict. And because people, especially people on the right tend to just simplify that into like Judaism versus Islam, um, which is really a pretty bad mischaracterization. Um, but I mean, certainly there's a religious undertone to it. So yeah, the, the tracks never again and writhe deal with, um, some of the, uh, complications with the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Um, the track rung deals with a 
Never Again is about um, is from the Israeli perspective. Uh, Writhe is from the Palestinian perspective. And the song Rung is about a true story where the Israelis and the Palestinians came to a head in a monastery. Or, I'm sorry, not a monastery, in a uh, in a cathedral. Um, so the, uh, the Church of the Nativity is a real spot, and it's the, you know, alleged historic site where Jesus was supposed to have been born. And it's in that place where you have um, the Israeli Defense Force, the Israeli military, fighting tooth and nail against some armed Palestinian militants, and it's literally on the birth site of the Prince of Peace. Yeah. The There's iron- all kinds the of, like... like irony insane poetic ironies to that um and and one of the one of the big tragedies there um because because we visited when when we did our study abroad i got to go and put my fingers through the bullet holes that are still on the pillars of that church i mean it's like dude you're just there and it's like so visceral i mean it's it's not like this ethereal thing that happened somewhere in some time past it's like you're seeing the remnants of it and it's nutty so um one of the only casualties of the entire 40-day siege was a mentally handicapped man who was the bell ringer of the church i mean there's just like what, what do you make of that i mean he was killed um accidentally by an israeli sniper by mistake I mean, mistake is the word if he wasn't the intended target, but someone was intended for that particular bullet. I don't want to make light of the situation, but a guy go through that that much training, who knows how long he sat in that crow's nest, finger on the trigger, shitting himself, waiting for three weeks to find that one target. I mean, there's nothing accidental about that trigger pull. Just the target itself was going to be somebody. And like you said, on the the irony side of the, the Prince of Peace, the man who, I mean, today's Easter and religious views aside is supposed to represent the rising from death. And mm-hmm. here we're telling stories about the exact opposite of what most religions teach, which is, you know, life, you know, the, the Lazarus yeah. effect is rising from, from the, uh, I guess I don't want to say ashes cause that's very Phoenix sounding, but you yeah. know, it's supposed to be uplifting. It's a great day. And that's ground zero for peace. Like you said, the Prince of peace was born on that particular land. And I know yeah. the only thing I know so far is that those two countries are just want that land. They just want to claim that w- Jesus was born in our country. No, he was born in our country. And I think ostensibly that is what this 2000 year war is about. I, th- I, I, I would, I would say that there is may, there's definitely like more complicated. Is, yeah. Yeah. Complicated is a, so, I mean, there definitely have been instances, um, where the the Jews have seized territory because of its, you know, alleged historic significance. Um, you know, with like, I want to say that uh, even the, the Mount Sinai um, was one of those territories that was negotiated and fought over, and the Israelis eventually won. Um, the, there's a lot, um, and I think it was, you know, I don't know why the war is there you know i went there for i went there for three months and you know spoke with the the uh israeli architect who built the palestinian wall dividing the west bank um from uh israel proper and i you know met with the uh brigadier general in the israeli army who was attributed with bombing the shit out of gaza and dropping you know essentially napalm on the civilians there i i met with Hamas and you know some of the higher ups in the Palestinian government. I don't know why the hell they're fighting. I don't know anything about the war. It's it's that level of complicated where like I I could spend the next 10, 20 years studying it and it's like I, I can't boil it down to oh this is why I, I mean there there's certain like of course there's certain core things that they are fighting for. Um, but dude, it's, it's, it's messy. Yeah. I, especially for how long it's been going on. Um, 
I don't know too many details, but at some point you just maybe even question whether or not they know, or if it's a matter of who's being told and who's calling the shots and who's just pulling the trigger, just point it that way and don't ask questions. Um, I know that can be a lot of war. I don't want to assume yeah. something I yeah. don't know about that particular war. Um, and I'm not like smart, but I'm definitely pro peace and I don't have any solutions. No one seems yeah. to, unfortunately. Um, Cause then you mix politics, the land battle, and then you mix that in with religion. And then it's just, it, it's just, it's so toxic. It's just like the napalm itself, but metaphorically is just a chemical mixture that is just not something that is, it's not helping. No, no, nothing's being accomplished. Except yeah. there's a lot of revenge, I think, is at one point what happens is this side takes some damage, that side takes some damage, and then they just it's infinite. Um And that's that's a running theme throughout the album is, you know, how do you as a normal human being justify you know, it, it how how do you as a normal person be pushed to the brink of terrorism where that seems like a rational decision? I mean that's that's horrifying. There was a a famous book that was written called Ordinary Men. Um, and I mean, the whole premise of the book, it's terrifying and gut-wrenching. But the whole idea is that the uh, the Nazis at the, at the death camps, they weren't subhuman. They weren't some other species from us. They were you. They were me. They were ordinary men who were somehow pressed into and not, and not to mitigate the guilt that they feel but I mean like it, it would be foolish for us to think that there's not a conceivable universe in which I would become a a terrorist or an Israeli soldier or a Nazi I mean it's not like it's not otherworldly to imagine that kind of scenario um, which is humbling I think and so, you know, the question rises like, okay, what are the ingredients for building a terrorist or for building a Israeli militant or any host? Because, uh, I mean, there's there's terrorism across the board in all three religions and beyond. Um, what, what are the ingredients that cause a person to act that way? And it's a damn complicated question. Yeah, not having been pushed there uh, myself, I don't want to assume you've not been through any kind of turmoil, but the fact that those <sighs> results of turmoil exist means that they are very realistic and they can happen to anyone with, like you said, the right chemical combination of whatever it is. Um, you mentioned it happens within all religions. It can happen within all races. No one is mm -hmm. exempt from going through turmoil that will push them to the brink of, of sanity. Um, and I think it's a lot more than just doing what you're told, which is always the excuse. Like, oh, oh, they're the Nazis. They were just doing what they're told. I'm like, but what they were being told, how they were being told it, and the circumstances with which they were being told, I'm not at all. There's no sympathy in, 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 in this discussion with me with whatever happened in Germany. Yeah. But to be there is a completely different point of view than I will ever have. And yeah. that is no excuse for what was done. I'm not trying to make uh, an excuse like, oh, well, if you were there, you probably would too. It's none of that. These are just crazy times within crazy circumstances that led to just unfortunate, vastly underrated, greatly yeah. devastatingly unfortunate events. Not yeah. just the thing we're talking about, but anytime someone results to violence, whether it's out of necessity, brainwashed, or retaliation it's just unfortunate that human conditioning exists where that can be a thing because on mm -hmm. the flip side we have people like you who get their outlet through plugging in a guitar and cranking the the monitors up and helping the world <laughs> and hopefully yeah hey you know the kids don't, the kids like it but it's not my thing i'm just kidding <laughs> I, I, I love it i love it um you had pre-released or not pre-released you had sent me what we're here for the top five heaviest tracks according to jared um they may not be the top five heaviest tracks according to everyone else in the world but they seem to be meaningful to you a lot of them actually i looked at the dates just because of um the bands i was super familiar with they all had been released at least seven years before it sounds like you were playing guitar 
So were these yeah. tracks that you grew up listening to that influenced you to want to make this style of music or just tracks that you oh. were like, oh, what did, you know, what inspiration for the list and how they affected what became heliocentric? Yeah. So, so like, like probably Meshuggah. Um, yeah, you name dropped Meshuggah in a previous video. I think it was an uh, interview you did. I'm like, I, I know exactly who this, this guy is as far as his, not not who you are, but musically I'm like, yes, the Meshuggah inspiration is absolutely there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. Thinking uh, thinking about some of that, um, Devin Townsend. That was who I was trying to think of. Devin Townsend has a song in his quote, or a quote in his song that says, we all rip off Meshuggah. Yeah. It's literally I, like in one of his songs. I'm a, I love that. I'm a huge um, Townsend fan. Uh, I don't know if right here, or if you saw maybe my rig rundown video, he has a delay pedal called the Ocean Machine named after the album, which is also named after Ooh. his guitar. If you were to ask me my top five heavy list, which I have not compiled, it would absolutely at least cons- consist of at least one SYL song. It would, mm. there, I don't. I, I it would take me forever to find it. It might be, you know, um, something from Alien, probably, or maybe even um, um, the first track off the first record. Heavy is a very heavy thing. The fucking hate you, a fucking <laughs> like. It might be that, but yes, De- heavy Devi, <laughs> definitely shout out to one of my favorite just people in general, let alone the music business. He's, He's a, a legend, legend, dude. Yeah. Gosh, man. But yeah, so. Um, Mashuga probably definitely uh, made me want to learn guitar. I've been listening to Silent Planet for over a decade now. Uh, That's awesome. almost a decade. Almost a decade. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to say like, oh yeah, they definitely inspired me to uh, pick up a guitar. But honestly, their stuff was always like so intimidating to me. It's like, nah, I can't do that. So... <laughs> Yeah, and they they tell a story much like you do, where like you, your songs are cohesive. They're not random. You do mix genres within one song, but you don't um, go spastic on it. You don't have like here's the deathcore part. Now here's a random country riff. There's the banjo right. behind. You know you don't do that. But I do hear the mix of like there's I, I hate genrefying bands. We're like, oh, it sounds like this, this, and this. But like there's the deathcore part. There's a cool clean part. You kind of have like a post hardcore screaming voice that you do like this awesome like speak talk, which I would never assume is you, but I know it's you because I've watched your music videos. <laughs> um, and we'll get into the assumption, the, the 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 judgment, the assumption of of Jared the person versus the musician after this. But uh, Silent Planet did that as well. Uh, um, what's the band? BT Bam between the Barry and me. They do something very similar where mm-hmm. it's like slow keyboards, very ethereal, and then there's this growing swelling of hardcore that comes in that elevates into a resolution that goes back to like a weird opera ballad, but it all sounds like the same song. Hmm. But that's what you do. Silent Planet does that. Um, and yeah, they've been around forever. Like I remember when they were a brand new band. I have their wiki up. They're from Azusa, which is a city near me. Um, kind of. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, it's like south... California, but like even souther than where I'm at right now. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, they've been around since 2009, which is right about when the I played very minimal shows with them when they were just starting out. And 2009 was kind of they blew up very quickly. Uh, they yeah. came out of nowhere. They had a local following, but I think they became tour gods. Like they just toured relentlessly, which is at the time yeah. when you could do that. What you have to do really to get out there is put butts and seats and music and ears and they're still doing the damn thing and i'm super proud of basically local boys do well in a genre that is so specific it's definitely prog rock but it's almost like post metal like what what yeah. devin what devin's doing um since key came out since um i love ziltoid the omniscient just very storytelling almost never repeats a section kind of music yeah um, so that influence I hear in, in your stuff because it's it'll start slow or church bells and then whispers pun intended and then out of nowhere the Meshuggah part or, and then back into something a little more ballady and then it all ties itself together in some big opus at the end. Um, so that influence is definitely awesome. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, I, I can Sorry. pause if I can pause if I need to. No worries. Awesome. Nah, it's all good. Cool. 
Um, so your top five list, were they in an order, or did you just want to run down all five of them? and then? Uh, yeah, no, no order. Okay. So you had picked, and I'll let you finish the, the, the list, Meshuggah's Dehumanization, which is a mm-hmm. heavy track that's, I mean, as dissonant as it comes. They're really good yeah. at the beat. Um, there's some shred in it, but they're not really exactly shred guys. They are rhythm guys for sure. Um, yeah. We covered Silent Planet. You had picked... Uh, I had the list up here. I was actually listening to the entire list as I was setting up today. Uh, do, 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 do. Northern I think it was Fro- Northern Fires. Northern Fires, awesome. Um, yeah. I have the video for Plea for Purging's Shiver up right now, which is a band I'm only familiar with um, because when I worked at Guitar Center, my entire accessories department was a band. <laughs> uh, and they were all into, the, the joke was the pig squeals, the oinks bands that did that that's what they were and they were awesome at it but they'd always be like oh plea for persian's awesome <laughs> like i can't you know like, that whole style i, I listen and I, I listen to it i'm like that literally sounds like i hate to say this someone's killing a pig like but that was the running joke with bands like that i think Whitechapel was kind of in that genre oh yeah yeah oh yeah um so that was my introduction to plea for persian <laughs> and I know that they do, they don't take themselves that seriously, which I love. I know they have a music video where they're like at a birthday or something, or they're like, oh yeah, no, they're super weird. So so the song uh, "Welcome to This World" by Primus, it's it's fun and it's whimsical and it kind of reminds me not to like take myself super seriously. I know that I won't ever do that. Like I, I'm never going to take my music in like a comedic direction. Like I'm a stupid cringy you know instagram comedy try hard i love like, dude i love I, but i keep that separate that from, aside like, i love side of it i love your videos that's just me kissing you <laughs> just kissing your ass dude you do some <laughs> dark comedy shit that's just straight out of evil dead and I, I love when you talk to yourself when you do the good jared versus evil jared conversations dude like go literally if you're watching this please i've tagged jared in the comments anything that says play even if it's not music just watch it if you don't laugh you don't have a soul (laughs) or or maybe you don't have a soul and that's why you're laughing (laughs) i mean i i do have like a very intended audience and that is those who have at least less than half a soul some people don't have one at all but like yeah if you're in the quarter soul half soul range then i'll take them man gosh to Primus, the reason I wanted to play bass, Les Claypool is a comedian. Uh, too funky yeah. for Metallica. I've seen his audition tape. Um, but he always makes fun of himself, which I can appreciate. I love that. I just yeah, I, I see so many bands doing, and I this is a joke I have with myself. They're always doing the mean metal face, like they're about to get in a fight. Mm-hmm. And I just always want to comment now, do a silly one. Cause in yeah. all, all of my maybe it's who I am, but in all of my pictures, I'm just like when I have to do serious face for, for metal bands, I just hate it. I'm just like I'm like, it's, it's yeah. mostly, are you done yet? Where if I take the picture of myself from my Instagram, I'm just like, hey, what's up? I write metal. It's, it's fun, man. Like, I just, I can't be, we're going to get a fight. We're going to get in a fight at the train yard with my bros. Like, that's not me <laughs> at all. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I, I don't know. It's, it's like, like, if if you're Mashuga, you can you can get away with stuff like that. But oh, I love, I love the Jens Kidman face. The, uh, Dude, oh, you, you, you do it. I forgot that you do it. And you do it. Thousand times better than I do. That was insane. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but yeah, I, I I love I love Primus. Um, I only discovered them like a couple years ago. I had a an ex girlfriend who introduced me to them. Um, shout out to, to Stephanie or Carol or whatever. Sh- sh- shout out to Stephanie. <laughs> Fucking Karen. <Or> Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully your current one is yeah. not watching. <laughs> uh, so. The last song, uh, the one that you, the final. one the one that's replacing the Primus song. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Head mounted sideways by Vola is the freshest thing in metal I have heard in years. I've literally ever even heard of this band. Is that V O L A? Yes. A Danish Swedish rock band. I was expecting it to say Deathcore yep. from Hell. Dude, they 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 play in like a super low tuning it sounds like that or they just have an insane bass tone if but like, like we're gonna get into something after this but we'll, we'll make it quick but I'm gonna let you finish <laughs> <laughs> dude 
dude i don't know the so they they only sing they don't have any screaming which like usually that's a turnoff for me because i assume that the singing is my girlfriend broke up with me is that what is that what the music makes you think that it's gonna sound like or is that just what well like when i hear like oh they're a metal band but they don't scream that's usually what i'm expecting it's like like how can you even be metal if that's what it is yeah it's it's like you know metalcore that sounds really boy band ish okay um i like it already but it's but but it's it's like like, vola Vola is is not not that that. they they have this this like tone in their in their vocal performances that's super unique and it's really refreshing um and so it's like this weird blend of like the singing isn't like super whaley or or anything like that it's just like it's really mellow and then the like drums and everything are super driving and it's like this weird like darting pace but it like feels serene it's really cool i get it i get it there's a couple bands i listen to that are kind of side projects there's a band i listen to called jesu uh which is short for jesuit which i know you're familiar with that word um Mm -hmm. because it's religious (laughs) haha Um, but Jesu is, uh, I think the guy is originally from a band called, not Godhead. What were they called? They're huge in like the digital metal world. Jesu. This is, I'm probably going to come up. There it is. Experimental metal band from Godflesh. There they are. And Godflesh uh, is like early 90s, like, I don't even know what to call it, like death metalcore, kind of like Fear Factory. Mm-hmm. But Jesu yeah. is heavy, slow layer guitars with. Almost kind of like Chino from Deftones whisper singing where it's kind of in the background where it's, he's almost singing as a cello, but then the drums are heavy. It's kind of like doom metal, but not sad sounding. Yeah. Um, and then another one was uh, Sunno, which is named after an old amp brand from the seventies, which if you look at their live setup, it's, it's, it's insane. It's, it's not, it's, it's, I don't, it's ridiculous. They just grabbed every amplifier from a thrift store and put it on stage. And there's like 70 of them. They wear dark robes, but it's as slow as you can get, but as heavy as you can get at the same time. It's not catchy, but if you're into slow, <laughs> doomy stuff, um, Sunno kind of fills that up too. Long live slow, doomy stuff, man. <laughs> yeah, Swallow the Sun's up there. Like, do- I had a doom phase for a couple of months when I was trying to find the best doom mm. stuff. Then I realized I was kind of falling asleep. <laughs> I-, I needed something with some pace. Um, I will check it's out real. Volo for sure. That just sound, that sounds like right up my alley too, for sure. Especially when it's not in a genre that's easy to de- describe, because I hate that. Yeah, it's it's gnarly, man. Hang on one sec. You are um, all good. There we go. Can you still hear me? Absolutely. Um, cool. And so, since we're on a recommendation kick, before we close it out, if you have not heard of, and this is just me shilling a band I believe in. Uh, a band called Loathe. Are you familiar with? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Loathe is amazing as well. You were bringing up how like Gojira doesn't down tune or um, how Vola is in some weird tuning or something like that. Um, I found Loathe on Spotify because I was listening to I don't know what. I just left the Spotify running and it just came up and I fell in love immediately. But doing research as I'm one to do when I hear cool guitar music, I want to find everything out about just not just the band but the players behind it. And then the gear behind that. These guys, if you're familiar with the music, are using Squire Jazz Masters, mm. which this is some of the heaviest music I've ever heard. And the trick behind that is they are using, they are in E tuning. So everything is E A D G B E, but down a full octave. <laughs> and I was like, bro, what, what just happened? So they're what? using, they're using $300 guitars and it's E, it's everything just a full octave lower and there's a demo video of them talking about they have to use like 82 bass strings on their on their sixth string i'm just like that's insane dude like i get it that that's i don't understand how they figured that out but yeah um yeah just just weird shit now i'm like well do i need to get a 300 hundred dollar jazz master i'm like <laughs> but i'm like i don't want to be loathe i want to be me so I'm always fighting this battle of like what the cool kids are doing and what I want to do. And I'm like yep. putting this pressure on myself. Then I have to talk myself out of it. And like, I'll, I'll try it out. I'm like, Oh, maybe I'll just take what's cool and like kind of assimilate it into my arsenal and then go from there. Um, which is yep. the story of my life. Like just learning what I want, 
and then seeing if it fits within what I write. And if not, I've got some cool tricks up the back, you know, in the back pocket. Definitely. Um, so for the viewers and listeners, I might put this on Spotify. I don't know. You can follow Jared everywhere. There's a major media outlet. Instagram's my favorite place because that's where he posts his videos. But there is music videos out on YouTube. It was is Gabriel the most recent one? And there's a teaser trailer for yep. something else. No, just Gabriel. Yeah, no teaser trailers yet. But uh, there might be a new single in the coming time. You heard it here first. I don't want to say. I don't want to put that, like you know how long. Can you but, deny yeah. or confirm that's a song that's already out, or is it not a song that's already out? It's a new song that has not been heard before. Uh, one thing I also <laughs> one thing I also loved is on Spotify when you just play it in the background, it shows video clips. It's not full music videos, but it's snippets. You're dude, you cover every single bass. You have the the comedy horror gimmick, not a gimmick. That's who you are, kind of. <laughs> um, <laughs> the music itself. You, uh, I saw on the cover of your book there was another name. I'm assuming the illustrations were done by a friend or family member, which is awesome. No, those were those were done by me. Oh, so the name that I saw on the front of the book, is it your middle name? Uh, yep, Jared, Jared Tracy. Tracy. That's Smith. what it was. Okay, your hand might have been covering it, so I thought maybe someone else. God damn, bro! Like you were a yeah, one man the, machine. The, the uh, uh, this this picture. So I mean, definitely like help was involved. So I had a handful of friends, you know, help me. Um, but yeah, they, they helped me with the lights and the fog machine, but this was, this is actually me on the album cover. Um, and then I passed off the camera to a friend and she <laughs> shot, I think it was like 500 pictures in that one photo shoot just so I could get this one picture that I edited and did all that to, uh, make happen. But yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I can imagine, man, that's, that's a journey that I'm, I'm on right now with whatever it is I'm doing at my little workstation here. It's very similar to yours. So I know I have the tools. Mm -hmm. um, the skills are the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm working on. Um, but absolutely follow Jared for any reason. I don't care if you like metal, if you don't like metal, if you like to have fun. Uh, very unassuming gentleman. I love that he has a dichotomy between... Um, I want to do a thumbnail real quick with us doing metal face. And then I brought my glasses. I want the nice guy Ooh. shot as well. Hold on. Where's my... Oh, frick. Where's my glasses frames? I've got, like, those nerdy glasses that uh, I put in some videos. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, they must be in the other room. I love the one you come, in the you come in the room as, like, I don't know if it's supposed to be, like, your brother or your evil or good twin or your dad. You're, like, holding a book. You're, like, hey, uh, did you want to maybe go out for dinner? And, and then you're sitting, like, I'm doing devil stuff. I, I'm paraphrasing the video but that's kind of what it is <laughs> um but yeah follow him everywhere you can you don't have to like metal jared's a great guy awesome musician i look up to him i got 10 years on this kid and he is twice as talented as i'll ever be um and i look forward to seeing what comes out next i i will be the first to blast it if i can um that's all i got man thank you guys for watching circle of debate podcast i've been chris kennedy jared smith of heliocentric you guys have a good night dude thanks so much for having me on